thanks for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, my name's Matt Syrett, uh, and to, tonight I'm going to talk to you about my career in 3D art. Um, it spanned, I first started uh, doing 3D art when I was at university back in 2008, um, and I've worked for a couple of different studios as well as um, doing a lot of academia as well. Um, so um, I was teaching at ARU for six years up until last summer when I made a transition back into studio work um, and I was a senior uh, lecturer there and uh, the master's course leader. Um, so I've, I've seen it from both sides, both from academia and also studio. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I graduated back in 2014 from Sheffield Hallam with a master's in animation and special effects. Uh, my undergraduate was in um, 3D modeling and animation at the University of Derby. Um, and since then, I've worked for, uh, on freelance projects as well as uh, running courses at universities um, and teaching at universities as well. Um, just some of the companies that I've worked for. Um, so as you can see on the left hand side, a lot of um, universities where I've either been associate lecturer or full time senior lecturer. Uh, or running uh, courses, um, and ARU being the last one that I worked at and ran the masters over there. Uh, in terms of companies, I've done a lot of freelance. Um, Vegas City is probably um, my first full-time studio gig where I'm a senior uh, 3D artist at the moment, uh, and I'll come on to what we do there in a bit. Um, Airship Images, which was an outsourcing studio, um, they've done work on uh, Forza Horizon, uh, The Division, they do a lot of character work and they brought me on board to deliver a football stadium for one of their real-time trailers um, and um, I worked there for freelance for them for six months. Um, Teleport Studios, which is what I've been currently doing before Vegas City freelance, um, is virtual production um, and I'll show you one of the adverts that we did for Now TV where we were taking um, Unreal 4 levels, sets that I was building and we were getting the actress in front of it and uh, doing virtual production. I'll explain a bit more for those who might not know what virtual production is. Um, Myriad, um, this was uh, a freelance gig uh, working with the US Air Force on a VR training application. Um, so I don't just work on game stuff, I do also work on uh, visualization, um, training, apps um, and currently working on live events in uh, Metaverse. Um, so I've, throughout my career I haven't just stuck to doing games, I've enjoyed doing like visualization for one of the first jobs out of university I was doing visualization for British Petroleum. Um, they pay really well, especially to a graduate coming out of university, um, but yeah. Uh, Go play games, they make mobile football games, um, so in my career I keep coming back to football stadiums uh, because I've built a few now um, and yeah. So how did I get into games? Um, at school, very average students, C grades. I think my highest grades were electronics. I think I got a B. Um, art, which I got an A. Um, and yeah, I, was, I didn't really pay much attention at school. Um, I did well in maths. Um, my teacher said to me, you'd never get anything more than a, I think it was a, a D grade. And I was quite close to getting a B grade at GCSE. And, uh, but yeah, so at college, I was quite average. Um, didn't really pay attention. Uh, sorry, at school. At college, did the same. I did three years at college. Um, I think I retook AS computing twice. I was doing AS computing while I was doing A-level computing. Um, which, yeah. And at college, I didn't have the opportunity to study games like nowadays. So I did uh, computing, business, BTEC, and product design. Business, BTEC, and product design, I passed straight away. I, I enjoyed those subjects, but I knew I wasn't a programmer, um, hence failing AS uh, twice. Um, so, and so I decided I was going to do business studies at the at university, and it was wasn't until. Um, someone came in, she was an alumni of the college um, from where I'm, I'm not from down here, I'm from Stoke-on-Trent. Um, and she came in and gave a talk about her experiences at university and like what she studied and then what she was doing now. And she actually studied business studies and hated it and she fell back to her programming roots. And she was the lead programmer on Halo 2, 
Um, so she kind of inspired me to go and study games at university, um, which was a, quite a hard sell to my mum um, because I was like, I'm going to go study video games. And she went, what? Uh, after I'd said, I'm studying business. Um, so yeah, so I took along to a few open days and we deci I decided I wanted to go to the University of Derby. Um, they'd just been recently taken over uh, by um, a good friend of mine now, uh, Dave Wilson, who used to work at Sony. Um, and he kind of like tempted me over. So I, I, I did three years there um, it, on the um, computer games model and animation course. Um, and I wasn't, again, this is a repetition of my life with education as I didn't switch on until the final year. Um, so when I finished university, I wasn't ready for the industry. Uh, my portfolio was not the best. So I spent a year working on it, doing free projects, modding, all sorts of things to kind of thing while I was working a full time, like a part time job in retail. Um, and during this time, my old lecturer actually asked me back, Dave Wilson, he said, do you want to come and do some teaching? Um, so I did and I, I, I did some associate lecturing and kind of that really helped me improve my portfolio because I had to teach people how to do it. And if, yeah, so it, it really spurred me along to get get on it and improve my portfolio. Um, during this time, I was waiting to do my master's. Um, just generally in teaching, it's better to have a master's. If you want to go work in the industry, you don't need a master's. Um, but to work in education, they like you to have the highest qualification. Um, I know ARU were trying to force me to do a PhD when I was teaching there, uh, which I was like, no, I'm not doing that. Um, but yeah, I was waiting to do my master's and uh, unfortunately it didn't run at the University of Derby, so I went to Sheffield Hallam. Um, and followed my old course leader, who was then the course leader there. Um, during this time, I started doing freelance. I did a little mobile game um, with, with someone at the University of Derby. Uh, he, he gave me some freelance work. Um, I was building mechs for them. Um, and then started my master's at Sheffield Hallam. Um, and during this time, we had a module where we had to make our own, we had to do an industry-led project, and that time, I'd started table foot games with um, my um, business partner, Dr. Tommy Thompson. Um, and we, we tried to make a game, uh, it was too grand in scope and it just, yeah, it wasn't going anywhere, so we canned it. And, and during this time I was teaching at the University of Derby as well with, with Tommy. Um, and he had a research project into procedural content generation. And I, I went into the office one day and he was, he was there um, with his, this, this very, he was very proud of his prototype of early shore footing. And I may have said some harsh words about the artwork because it was just programmer art. It was pink boxes everywhere. And I, I was, I was, I, I admit I was wrong. I shouldn't have gone in as harsh as I did. Um, but he challenged me to do it. And um, I came up with the art style for the game, which we released uh, back in 2008, uh, 2018. And then last year we released on Xbox um, and yeah. Um, after my masters, I started working at Airship Images um, and, then f and then during all this time, I've been working as a senior lecturer um, and also doing freelance work on the side. That's one good thing about being a lecturer. Um, I could get away and do freelance work um, even alongside my teaching responsibilities. The act I, my boss at ARU actually encouraged it. So there's a few times where I disappeared for two weeks because I was working on a freelance project or that sort of stuff. So, so teaching kind of helped me facilitate those freelance projects. So where I'm currently working, uh, so I'm currently working for Vegas City. Probably no one's heard of this company. Um, what we do is uh, live events inside of uh, Metaverse. Does everybody know what Metaverse is? No, yes, some people. Um, so it's an online world that's living. So um, uh, Facebook currently we're, we're throwing out metaverse and these, these living worlds. Um, we currently do live events for Decentraland, which has been going for quite a while and it's quite established and it's a web browser uh, application. So you can log in um, to, to the application and walk around this virtual world and go to events. Um, Recently, we, we, we did work on the Metaverse um, Music Festival where we had um, four days of live artists playing within a streaming video into the world. Um, and we had like Dead Mouse and uh, uh, Paris Hilton did a DJ set. Um, 
Dead Mouse was quite good. Uh, I didn't stick around for the Paris Hilton and stuff. Um, but yeah, so lots of live events. Um, and I'm currently running um, the team on the university side for the art. Um, and this is the idea behind it is to facilitate online learning uh, through avatars. Um, and I've been building this district up with a team um, to, to kind of uh, be able to facilitate that. Uh, currently, we have the University of Hong Kong Medical School. They do all their open days through this, through this platform. Um, and um, we have other, other, other institutions interested in coming into this space. And um, my day-to-day -day on this varies. I, either do, I have either been doing the 3D modeling, setting the art style, the direction. Um, I also do a little bit of technical stuff on here, um, liaising with the clients if they've got their own build. I help them get it into the engine um, because it's completely different to, 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 to a lot of engines. Um, and yeah, this, this, is, this is what I've been running for the, since I joined in August. Um, this was part of uh, the Meta Festival um, and I worked with a small team on the acoustic stage. So I was building props for them, like the picnic benches, the um, food trucks, um, some, of the, some of the other smaller props as well. Um, so there was a small team I was working on that stage and then the one on the top left, which is the Hex Club, um, that was my own build. Um, I got given some concept and then I built it and I had to work with brand guidelines for that because that was being sponsored by Monkey Shoulder. So one of the cool things with working with, with Vegas City is that I get to work with a lot of different clients who have their own brand guidelines and I have to kind of like get sign off on it and that's sort of, it can be fun and it can be a pain but majority of the time it's quite fun. Um, more recently, which I can't show, um, but we did work on a, a major Grand Slam tennis tournament where we brought their precinct in to the world um, and we had a tennis game and we had live footage from, from that event and then there was an after show uh, party at the end that we, that we ran. So what we do at Vegas City is a lot of live events and a lot of things that are live streamed and that sort of thing. So uh, we, we build venues, we, we manage the, the screens and the, the connections um, and we also manage a lot of land within, within the game. Um, so something completely different. So this was with Teleport Studios. Um, and this was for Now TV. It's not always easy, is it? Um, it feels so like everyone's this world's was, gotten smaller. Um, for Teleport Studios, and, and all this uncertainty uh, I was tasked makes with building sets ever to unwind um, for them to use um, in the advert. So the only thing that's real is the bed and a bedside table and the actress, uh, Sheridan Smith. Uh, the rest of it was all done with virtual production. So there's a massive curved screen. Um, and then we track the camera in game in Unreal Engine uh, with a real world camera as well. And we also set up the lighting to match in engine as well. Um, and that allows us to kind of parallax without green screen. You get sometimes you get that kind of um, weird effect. Uh, but with this, because it's tracking using a HTC Vive, um, you can kind of get a nice pan track on it. Um, this was one of the scenes that I was solely responsible for, which was the French Riviera. Um, and with this as well, we're transporting it to different locations, which it was in the height of the pandemic. So we were actually in a, under the arches under, uh, in London, uh, in a studio and um, yeah. Um, and this company is also doing stuff for like car adverts, like replacement of the, like when you see a car going past and you've got the windows, they've been doing it with virtual production stuff. Um, so on the day, so beforehand we had about two weeks to build the sets um, and then on the day I was responsible for helping with optimization, uh, making sure things were running at like 80 frames a second um, and also uh, just generally sometimes the director didn't like a plant in, in a certain position so we would just move it in engine and then it's ready to go. So, um, And yeah, it was, it was definitely interesting and Sheridan Smith was really nice. She came up to us at the end, uh, me and the technical director, and said, I don't know how you guys have done it like today. And we were like, I was thinking to myself, I don't know how I did it either. Because uh, there was a lot of button pressing and then going, did this work? Did, did that change something? Um, so yeah, so lots of things to learn from those, like kind of doing live events. Um, and yeah. 
Um, so this was a, a project while I was teaching, um, I got to work on. Um, so this was a club soccer director. Um, I worked on two iterations of it. Um, and this was for mobile. So a lot of the projects that I've done have been quite varied. Um, some of them have been on mobile, some of them have been in VR, uh, some of them, uh, like now I'm on web, um, and I've also done Xbox and Switch as well. So a lot of the times, I, I, as a freelancer, you kind of have to switch sometimes to different platforms. And this was on mobile, so it came with its own uh, challenges. Um, yeah, <laughs> lots of challenges, especially with, with uh, real-time shadows and that sort of things and texture budgets. Um, so with this project, I was, um, they didn't have any 3D before I came on board. Um, and they asked me to basically build out their stadiums, um, their facilities and their environment so that they could go 3D because originally it was all 2D, uh, hand-drawn stuff. Um, and it was really cool, uh, fun project to work on. So the stadiums all have uh, multiple upgrades. Um, so that was a challenge to kind of uh, be able to, to do that. Um, and also, um, so I think in total I did seven stadiums, seven, um, ranging from non-league to, I think I did Real Madrid's um, stadium um, as, as the premium content. Um, because I, I know they, they were charging uh, real world money to buy that stadium. Um, so it had to be like the best stadium. Um, and yeah, uh, I was responsible for doing the, the, the environments as well. Um, we did, I did get some asset packs, the cars, because again, quite tight deadline. Um, so there was a lot of um, things that happened like that, but the majority of the stuff that I built myself um, and the shadows, uh, how we kind of got around the shadows was um, little alpha planes with, with a shadow texture on it, um, just because it was yeah, cheaper than, than having real-time shadows. Um, I did uh, offer some solutions for the stadiums because we couldn't bake lighting, because the stadiums would upgrade, so you would have the shadow already baked into the, the stadium. Um, and one of the solutions that I did come up with was we're pre-baking the lighting in a different scene and asset loading into uh, the, the main project scene. Um, so yeah, so sometimes I've had to do more technical stuff just to kind of get, get, get the art in there and working. Okay, I've got a video for this as well. Um, so this project was, um, something that I, I only had a month on uh, because we only had a month to do it. Um, like, like I said, the, the Now TV stuff was a very quick turnaround, um, whereas the, the, the football stadiums I had about six months to do um, before, before the release, whereas the, the Now TV stuff and this, it was like a month in total on it. On it. Um, and this was an application for the US Air Force, so it was quite a big client. And it was actually one of my ex-students, uh, Reese, who said, Matt, we need some help. Do you want to come down and help out on this? I was like, yeah, sure. Um, and we, we, we uh, built it for them. Um, it's to set up a piece of equipment, which is quite expensive. It's a weather radar system, I think, or something like that. So Reese did the, the equipment and I did the environment around it. So building textures. And uh, as you saw as well, there was multiple like weather, um, weather happening as well. So I was responsible for, for, for doing that. Um, and yeah, I think it was, I, I, the US Air Force still use it to train, their, to train their personnel around the world because all they have to do is send out a HTC Vive uh, instead of this massive expensive equipment. Um, uh, and yeah, it was all to do with weather readings and that sort of stuff. So yeah, it wasn't drones. So this next project I'm gonna show you was my Personal project, well no, it was a personal project at the start, but we turned it into a commercial product. Um, and this was Sure Footing, which we released back in 2018 on PC and then Xbox last year. Um, and this was run um, with my business partner, Dr. Tommy Thompson. Um, I've stepped away from that now because uh, I'm busy with other stuff and he's quite busy as well with his YouTube channel and also consultancy. Um, and we built this um, 
we were self-funded. Um, and the reason why we, we kind of did it ourselves was because we'd not, at this point, we'd not released a game. We hadn't taken a game from concept to published. Um, so we wanted that and it really helped with, uh, with, uh, with teaching as well. Um, because we could say to the students, look, we've, we've actually made a game and we've uh, ported it to different uh, platforms. Um, and like I said, we, we, um, we were working on this for, for quite a few years in our, in our spare time. I would not recommend doing it in spare time. Just don't do it. Don't go indie straight away. It's... Um, and don't self-fund it either. Um, yeah, a lot, lot, of, lot of time went into that. Um, and um, I was in a very fortunate state where I was teaching as well. So I had an income coming in, but a lot of people, a lot of young people do go, um, go indie straight away. And it's like, I don't know how you support yourself um, because it, it is really hard. Um, if you asked me, would I do it again? No, <laughs> I wouldn't do it again. Um, and actually one of the projects I'm going to show you in a minute, we, we've put on hold because we don't want to fund it ourselves. We want it funded and to do it justice as well. We need, we need, a, we need, we need to fund it. And we just don't, like, like I said, I have a lot of stuff going on now and Tommy does. So we don't have the time to kind of put, put to it. Um, but yeah, so sure footing. Um, it was, it, I, I enjoyed it. It was a fun project. It was fun working on it as well because um, I got to kind of like set the art direction and kind of uh, lead a very small team, um, an animator and another 3D artist. Um, and I did stuff that I'd never done before. So I was working on the UI as well. Um, and it was always fun to work to when we initially started like prototyping the platforms, because when you're working with a procedural content generation AI, you, I couldn't see what the level, because it, it, it changes every single time. So trying to figure out which platform worked with which platform and to get it to actually work and making sure the jumps were, were doable was, was a fun experience. Um, I think that's why I would never work on an infinite runner again using procedural content generation because as an artist, I couldn't craft the levels. They were done by the computer. I just plugged in an asset and away it went. And if it worked, it worked. If it didn't, I wouldn't find out until I'd actually come across that platform. So yeah, it was, it was fun working on that. Um, and also when you work with your business partner who's colorblind on a very colorful game and you say, oh, I've changed that color. And he's like, no, you haven't. What? Oh, it was frustrating. Um, but it did teach us to work together. Um, I think at the start we had a lot of arguments uh, with, with direction and that sort of stuff. But, and like, he'd say, oh no, we can't do that. And I'd be like, yeah, we can. And, by the end, we were like, okay, can this be done? Is it doable in the time frame? Um, so a lot of things got like completely canned from, from that project. Uh, like, it, like it happens because there's, uh, for, for anybody who's worked in the game, there's feature creeps. Uh, just when you're working with just two of you day to day, it's, uh, yeah, it's like, oh, we can do this. Like, I remember um, one of the things we prototyped was um, Pixel Pete, who's the main character, would get smacked into the camera. We went away and prototyped that. And we were like, oh, it'd be cool if he exploded as well. Bearing in mind, this is the Peggy Rayty 3 plus game. And it is a, it's only cube characters, but still, um, one time the character, uh, Pete got smacked into the camera, exploded, and all you saw was half his face going down the screen. And we were like, we can't put that in. Um, and the other things we made, we did a lot of touring, like at game events. And if you have got your own game, just get to like Insomnia and, uh, the other the other events because it's really good um, especially if you can get on like their free stuff um, and we took it to events one of the biggest ones that we used to take it to was Norwich we loved going there because it was it was family friendly and our game is uh, thingy and that's actually how um, the four player co-op came about because a, a mum came up to us and she had four kids and she was like is this multiplayer and we were like no and we were like, and she's like, oh, I wished it was multiplayer because my kids love it and they're fighting for the controller. And we were like, okay. So we went away and Tommy prototyped actually the multiplayer that night in the hotel. Um, and we had a very janky version running the next day. Um, so yeah, so a lot of, we got a lot of like feedback from the public at these events and it happened. And one of the reasons why we had four other characters coming into play was 
a little girl came up to us and was playing and she was like, do I always have to play as the boy? And it's like, hang on, how will we gender a cube? I don't know how we did it, but we, we, we rectified it. So, and accessibility options as well was, was quite big um, that, we, that, we, that we put in in the end as well. So um, we, we did a lot of prototyping with the public and going out and getting people to play test it and that sort of stuff. I think we, we got colleges to play test it because we're not a big company. We can't afford a QA department. So we actually got local colleges to play it and test it for us. And their students got a bit of experience testing a game. We got free testing um, and yeah, vice versa. So yeah, a lot of things we had to do ourselves uh, as well. So this was one of the projects that I was talking about that we've postponed and kind of put on ice. Um, as a 3D artist, I've got so many projects in the vault that are never gonna happen. Um, one tip I can give you if you are an aspiring 3D artist is finish your projects. I've got so many sitting in a vault that I just haven't finished or I haven't had time or I haven't gone back to. Um, and yeah, and it's really good when you do finish a project because it's like, oh, I can share this on my portfolio and that sort of stuff. So, but like in the games industry, projects get canned all the time. Um, and this was the one we canned for, um, for, for Table Flip and kind of we've gone our own separate ways now. Um, so this was Cenotaph, which was a World War I poetry um, exploration game. Um, so the idea was that we were gonna use GCSE curriculum um, to make this kind of uh, story-led uh, e entertainment game, um, bit on the lines of like What Remains of Edith Finch and Valiant Hearts. Um, and we just realized we just needed too much money to do it justice um, because we really wanted it to be something special. And we just knew that um, it, it, if we try and approach it like we did with Sure Footing, which was in uh, respect, was quite a small game, um, we wouldn't do it justice. Um, we were working with someone from the University of Cambridge who was, she's a English, uh, she's doing a PhD um, in English literature. Um, so we got a few people on board to kind of like prototype and go through, um, make sure that it was accurate to the GCSE curriculum and that sort of stuff. Um, and we got a few levels prototyped, but yeah, um, we, just, we just thought it was just like, yeah, no, this is, this is not gonna happen. Um, too big again. So there's a lot of times where you'll scope out a project and it'll be way too big and you kind of have to then realize, okay, I need to bring this in and then bring it in and then bring it in. And then it's probably not what you wanted it to begin with, um, but it happens. And it's the same when working with clients and that sort of stuff. Um, they have their vision, uh, you have your vision and you kind of have to align your vision to their vision, especially with client work. Um, and yeah, um, one of the things has been as a 3D artist that I've learned is not to be precious about your work um, because someone's not going to agree with it or someone's not going to like it uh, or um, they're going to ask you to change things and critique it. So you try not to be too precious about, about the work that you're making for it. That's a very hard statement to, to adhere by as well. Um, sometimes it does get a bit hard. Um, and alongside all of this, I still do personal work. So I try and upload stuff on the online stores where I get a passive income um, and some of the other stuff. Um, so I think this was around the time my, stu my students were doing photogrammetry and I'd never done it before. So to help support them, I went away and did some photogrammetry using, uh, using a camera. Uh, so I went out to Thetfield, Thetfield Forest, I think it is. Thetford, Thetford. Forest um, with my camera. This was before the pandemic um, and took some imagery and then brought it back in and photo, uh, like used um, one of Substance's uh, pieces of program to kind of build these photogrammetry textures. Um, and that was just to kind of help support um, one of my students at the time. Um, and then I, I started to do more stylized work. And that was mainly because I wanted to get back into ZBrush because I hadn't used it for, for quite a few years. So I do find that sometimes I'll use a piece of software um, and I haven't used that software in ages. So I'll do a, a piece to kind of get back into it. And this was mainly to do with ZBrush and stylized art. Um, and yeah, um, 
I know this last image was a test piece for Teleport Studios, actually, um, to show them how they could use assets from, from, from the store and actually build environments quite quickly for them. Um, but yeah, so the, the stylized stuff um, I really got into and then I haven't touched ZBrush since starting my new job because we don't use it because it's all low poly. Uh, so for, for the new stuff, we, we have very strict texture budgets and uh, polygon budgets as well uh, for, for 3D modeling. So yeah, I haven't even gone back to ZBrush. Uh, I don't think I've got a license now for it. Um, and yeah. Um, cool. Thank you for listening. Um, if anybody's got any questions. Okay, so let's say you've finished your degree, uh, you've got a first, woo, you apply to loads of places for a job, and it doesn't quite work out. Um, would you then recommend doing a master's to continue building portfolio? Or... <sighs> um... So for me, it worked out because I was I, 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 I graduated with a two two and my portfolio was rubbish, so I wasn't in that position. I I needed the extra time to to kind of practice and build my portfolio up. Um, I think I think doing a master's how I used to say it at ARU when I used to promote it and they'd probably kill me um, if they found out that I used to do it this way was I used to say like if if you're not feeling comfortable with your artwork. Um, do the masters because it gives you an extra year of structure and thingy, but it's not going to get you a job in the industry. Um, if you've already got a, a portfolio and you, you think it's ready, then I would agree with apply for jobs mm. and not just look at games jobs, look at mm. architectural visualization. I've had many students go to work for ArcViz companies and they're still working in ArcViz. Reese, for example, um, who I worked with on the VR project, he turned down a games job to go work on ArcViz because it paid mm. better. Yeah. So I think don't close your mind to those other areas that use your expertise because they, they, that could be a way in. Um, he's now working, he, did, he worked on the, the Beijing, it was the Olympics coverage where the studio wasn't a studio, it was all virtual production. I think the only thing that were real were the presenters and the table, because if you notice on one of them, uh, the green screen, the foot out. Um, so yeah, uh, I did mention that to him. Um, but yeah, like he works in thingy. Um, Emily, brilliant um, at, at ARU, the graduates of ARU. Emily, she's a brilliant 3D artist. She went to work at Myriad, um, where, where Jason actually did some work as well um, while I was there. So. Um, it, yeah, try and apply for other places if, if games isn't quite Working. taking you on. And don't get disheartened because it does take a while. Um, Lock out the bucket kind Pardon? of thing. Pick out the bucket kind of thing if you're good. I think go to networking events as well. Like mm -hmm. go to speak to the people who are working at those studios because, yeah, like sometimes if, if you're going in on a cold approach to, to, to just a job application, then i um, thinking a lot of jobs I've got, I've known people there. Mm. Um, so yeah, get out there, network, and uh, I think the best advice: don't be a douche, because people will hear about it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? What would your recommendation be for tools for some a student before they go into university uh, to practice? Three D tools. You mentioned ZBrush. Yeah. Um. So uh, I'm mayor. I have been since 2008. Um, that being said, I'm now using Blender as well. Um, I think it's good to learn on one piece of software first. I think some students try and be like, I'm going to learn Maya and Blender and Max at the same time. It's not going to happen. So I think the best advice for that is, is obviously Blender's free. And as a student, you can get Maya, full version of Maya and 3D Max. So I'd recommend picking one and learning the principles behind 3D modeling. Um, because you, you can transfer those skills onto a new piece of software. Um, it's just about finding out where the hotkeys are in that process. Um, so coming into the job that I'm in now, I never use Blender. I actually detested it. I hated it. Um, now I use it every day. Um, so yeah, so like 
and we, I use it for specific things. So the 3D team at Vega City, we're all Maya users. But the end, getting it into the engine, uh, we use Blender because Blender has a better exporter for web files uh, over Maya. So each tool does things better than the other tool, but I think learning those 3D principles first and then applying it to different pieces of software once your expertise in one is a lot easier than trying to learn all software. ZBrush, for example, is very expensive, like for a student and for, for like industry. So Blender has a really good sculpting package now uh, that's built in. Um, when I was learning, we were learning Mudbox, which is not even used anymore. I mean, we were using X normals as well and Crazy Bump to do normal mapping um, when I was learning and they, they're not used anymore. So I think also as well, being open to learn new pieces of software, new techniques is, is, is key. Like if I, when I used to speak to Jason, like he'd tell me stuff about PlayStation 1, I'd be like, that's not even a, that, that workflow doesn't even exist anymore. Um, so yeah, so like, I think, I think it's just being open-minded and also just like, don't spend too much. Um, I'm lucky that my company pays for Photoshop, but if they didn't, I wouldn't use it because I use Substance Painter and Designer nowadays to do, to do the texturing. Um, so my, my workflow is I use Maya to model and UV. Um, then I use Substance Painter and Designer to, to build textures and paint the textures on the model. And then I use Blender for material setup and export. And that's my workflow now. Um, and that'll change. So if I went to a different company, I might be using an in-house technology. Um, we don't use an engine. Oh, it's an engine, but it, it's Unity, but it's, it's not Unity, what we use for, for, for Decentraland. We have to load every, every model through um, a visual, uh, visual script. Um, and then we have to boot it up to a web browser. And then only then we see the 3D graphics. So actually, um, whereas Unity and Unreal, you can see, and modern game engines, you can see your assets, move them around in 3D in the engine and all that. Uh, for, for Vega City and for Decentraland, we don't see it until it's in the web browser. Um, and then we have to refresh the browser if we make a slight change with a movement. So actually we build things like sets because trying to place individual assets could take us hours because we just don't have that. So you have to be willing to learn those uh, processes. And I don't know too much about the script stuff on, on the side, but I know enough to say to one of the devs who does, it's like, oh, can we do this? Oh, that's probably not doable. So even though I'm not a programmer, I do know a little bit on the dev side because it's just easier to interact with, with, the, with the programmers and the devs. Um, when you're asking them nicely to do stuff because you can't do it. And you're like, please, can you make this door open for me? Um, but yeah, I think that's... So do you have any recommendations for learning materials and teaching materials for something like Blender? Um, I mean, there'd be millions of things on the web, but finding something that's good is not always easy. So a friend of mine sent me a video the other day um, for, for Blender, and that was for someone who's coming from Maya which was perfect for me because it was coming from someone who's already experienced 3D modeler and they're just learning the new software. I know Flip Normals do some really good tutorials and some really good like uh, talks um, about 3D, about ZBrush, about Blender, about Thingy. So yeah, I'd recommend Flip Normals. Uh, there's a couple of the guys, um, 3DX uh, does some really good stuff on Stylized and Stylized Nation as well. Um, when I was doing a lot of stylized stuff, uh, Stylized Nation has got a workbook um, and it's a load of different lessons. I think it's 45 pound and it's a load of different lessons. I bought it and it, it also gives you the models as well. So if you want to just practice your texturing skills, you can just practice your texturing, texturing skills in substance. Um, so yeah, so I think Stylized Nation, 3DX and Foot Normals are the ones that I go to because I know they're good quality. There's a lot of tutorials out there. Um, some are good, some are bad, uh, some are outdated. Uh, I think my tutorials that are on YouTube are outdated now. So um, yeah, so there's, you kind of have to thingy, pick the best. Thing. But yeah, definitely flip normal stylized nation. Uh, they're a good set. Okay, thanks a lot. Cool, any other questions? Um, it isn't really art related, but I was wondering how much you thought the pandemic has boosted or helped the idea of the metaverse and online events? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, the I mean we've been we've we've been inundated with 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 work. Uh, we've we've hired um, so many devs over the last month or so um, to, to kind of keep up with that with that demand. Um, so I think it is spurring along. Um, I think Facebook helped a little bit because they were like, yeah, we're doing Metaverse, but their Metaverse isn't publicly available. So a lot more people were like coming to Decentraland and going, we want events. So I know recently they've hosted Samsung and like we hosted a big sporting event. Um, so yeah, so I think that for, and some people won't get it. My partner hasn't got a clue about it. She's like, why? Why, why can't I just watch it on the computer? And I, I think it, it, coming from, from, from gamers, I think we're a, bit more, um, we're a bit more in line with that and we, can, we, we like to socialise online. Like during the pandemic, I, uh, like it really affected my partner because she's very sociable, she's very outgoing. Whereas me, I, I could chat to my mates on Xbox and I'd be all right. Um, so I think having that virtual area for people to go and talk to about similar interests um, like in the sporting events, talking about different, ma- we were showing old matches and stuff like that, and people were sitting there and chatting to each other about it. So I think being able to facilitate that off in 3D is, is really good. Um, how, how it's going to evolve, um, I think the best way to describe it is like the dot com boom. So everybody's like cryptocurrency, NFTs, all this, and it, at some point it's going to plateau out um, like, like uh, the dot com. Um, when that is, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I know I'm having fun building environments for, for it. So. Yeah. so at the museum, we teach um, kids, mostly school-aged, um, sort of early teens, um, programming and electronics, all sorts of things. Um, but there is seemingly kind of a, a growing request, and we do do this a bit more ad hoc, but about game programming, because mm-hmm. just kids want to program games. Um, can you advise on any way to get... Look, and, and also, secondly, a lot of parents say, what should my kids be doing mm. to get a career in games? And this is early on, so you know, it's a little bit too early in many ways. But is there anything you can recommend um, parents for um, you know, getting their kids involved in game programming? Um, game programming, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm glad to say that, because it's a lot easier to recommend programming than art. Because, uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, programming. Um, I know schools try to teach Scratch. Um, but to get someone into it, I think a visual programming language is good. Like if you try and get them to do like C sharp or C plus plus straight away, it's going to scare them off. Um, I think getting them to understand that there's a difference between playing games and making games. I think that was definitely something in education that I found hard to, to get across, um, especially when students were coming, um, from college and that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, getting to understand that there is a difference and like playing 40 hours of Fortnite a week isn't, isn't making games. Mm. It's the complete opposite. You probably won't be playing games because you're, you're, you're focusing all your effort on that. Um, I think Scratch is probably good. Game Brio, not Game Brio, whoa, no, not Game Brio. That's an old engine. No, don't do that one. Um, game Maker. Right, yeah. Uh, sorry, Game Brio was like Fallout, uh, yeah public version of engine and it was a horrible engine <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't do that um, no um game makers uh, pretty good for 2d um and there's, there's lots of lots of material out there and it's thingy um i think at school as well if they've got if they if they like maths and problem solving i think that's always always good to have even as an artist problem solving is probably a good thing to have in games um and uh, yeah maths i <sighs> I, I don't, at college, I don't recommend doing a games course. I've never have. Um, I think, but that's because I never did one and I haven't had much experience with, with college courses with games. Um, so I always recommend if you want to do programming, maths, physics, um, computing um, is, is a good way to go at college. If you want to do art, um, I think some of the best artists that I recruited on the games courses was they come from fine art and illustration. Like some of the best master students that I had were illustrators. They hadn't got a clue about 3D, but when they came in with their, their, their illustration degree, they, they, they outperformed people who were coming from a games course um, because they, they already had the artistic ability there and the, 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 
the core art skills like uh, composition, colour theory, that sort of thing, that, that those uh, thingy. And that's one of the things that I did used to teach at ARU was more about uh, like composition and how to kind of present the work and uh, environmental storytelling as well and that sort of to make the work stand out. Um, but yeah, as, as a thing, it's, it's, in, it, it's really hard because like at that age, um, we used to get the best idea. We used to do um, um, a thing at Norwich. Tom used to do uh, like, a, like a talk at Norwich and used to have school kids coming in and they used to shout ideas of the games that they wanted to make and then Tommy and Sean would make it in Game Maker there and <laughs> live. And the amount of ideas that we used to get from, from, from the kids was, it was just amazing. But there's a certain point where like, that interest just drops off. So I think talking to, to that age as well is, a, is important because yeah, keeping them engaged through, through school, through college, then into the university if they decide to go there. Um, yeah. Secondary question. Okay. Do, do, do you think that, that um, people are kind of pre-designed to be, uh, well, anything for that matter, but, you know, programmers or artists or whatever. I mean, so a lot of people say, oh, I want to put um, little Sally on, on a course to do games and you actually can see that she's not necessarily that interested or whatever or, you know, whoever. Um, do you think that it's just natural and people just go that progression or do you think it's something you learn? I, um, being creative is hard to teach. Mm. Mm. So... Um, I think that that's one thing. If you're not really creative in the sense, it's quite hard to kind of teach that and get, get that across. Like 3D modeling is quite easy to teach. Like it, it's, 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 it's a process and it's very technical, but like being able to create those assets is, is a lot harder because you have to have that artistic flair and skill and that sort of stuff. And I've had students who haven't had it. They've, they've gone through three years and they just don't have a creative bone in their body and it, they, they, they go and work for, I don't know, some, so not, not games, mm. because mm. They, don't, they can't show that in their work. And whereas I've had students come with lots of creativity and they seem to flourish the most. So that, that, in that, I think Ty, I think one of the reasons why I don't recommend games courses at colleges is because you're focusing too early, I think, on that. Uh, is like, I think good programmers tend to do uh, programming degrees, not games programming. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, yeah, if you're, if you're going into narrow at that point, but, um, and also you might change, you might decide that you prefer art. And like Tommy had that choice. He, he's a programmer, he's an AI programmer, um, but he was a really good artist as well. Um, so he had the choice and he made that choice to go down the programming route, um, mainly to follow in his uh, father's footsteps. Um, he had the opportunity to think. I knew I wasn't a good programmer. <laughs> I had to redoing uh, computing a, uh, AS like twice uh, definitely showed that. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, sometimes you can be a bit narrow-minded. And I've had students who've, on, on, a, on a different note, have wanted to just work on one game. And it's like, you can't do that. You're limiting yourself too much. Like being open-minded to games, different platforms, that sort of stuff will, will help. Um, and they, they just wanted to work on one game and one game only and they didn't last. Yeah. They never finished the course because they're quite narrow, they were quite narrow-minded in that sense. So I think, yeah, there is, there is a lot of pressure for, for you're either going to be a programmer or an artist and you might, you might, do, you might be a programmer and then you realise, I don't like programming. Uh, I've known people who've switched um, who um, did, the art did an art course and then went and did three years as a, on, the pro on a programming course uh, or did a master's to, to switch that, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's, it's not too late. You've got to enjoy what you're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's the, the best thing to say for that is you've got to enjoy what you're doing because it, it is hard. <laughs> At the end of the day, if you go into it as well, those skills are pretty transferable to other areas as well. I mean, yeah, like I was saying, with 3D, part, yeah. like any any industry that uses 3D, um, it is is really good. You can transfer for over, and um, that's that's what I've done through my career. Is like I haven't just solely done games because a lot of the times the ones that aren't games pay pay a lot better um, and don't and have a nine to five. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.